Everybody can hear me. Yep. Great. All right. Um, so welcome to the final presentations, fall 2020 for the urban entrepreneurship class. We're glad that uh, you all can uh, join us. I know our students are uh, anxious to give the presentations and also probably anxious to have it over with. So uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my teaching team partners here. Uh, uh, Reggie Barnett has been an advisor for the course, uh, not only this year, but several years going back. We throw a lot of things back and forth, and he helps me out greatly. Mr. Barnett, uh, JD, and MBA from Duke, uh, as uh, any of you uh, students know, and he also uh, went to Notre Dame, eh! <laughs> won the national championship with Notre Dame, uh, back in, we won't say when, it was a while ago. Uh, and uh, so Reggie's been an advisor for the course and uh, Sonia, as I mentioned a minute ago, is our instructional assistant, done a great job this semester, really been a big help uh, for the class. Um, and I'd also uh, <clears throat> like to thank our urban entrepreneur partners. Uh, uh, two or three of them are on the, uh, are on the call, uh, more may join, but uh, one of the things we did this semester uh, in terms of making uh, lemonade from lemons, uh, given that we are in a remote environment, we decided to expand the geographic reach of the course and engage entrepreneurs in more than just Southeast Michigan. So just going down the list, uh, one of our partners is uh, Makapui Awuku. He's in, um, he has a company called Macintosh Africa in Accra, Ghana. Uh, Jason Habiger, as we just mentioned, rides Scusi in Tampa, Florida. Godwin Ian Tuge, Young Village in Detroit, David Alade, Century Partners Detroit, uh, Nassim Golzadeh, uh, Shot Spotter Technologies out in Newark, California, and uh, Sergio Rodriguez uh, Tuduli in Detroit. So those are our six uh, urban entrepreneur partners. We have six urban entrepreneur partners and six teams uh, this semester. So I'd also like to thank our uh, guest reviewers, uh, James Fegan, uh, was uh, participated in one of the class sessions as a, as a guest speaker earlier this semester. And since then, he has a new job. He's the director of entrepreneurship for the Rocket Community Fund uh, over in Detroit. And uh, so he's got a really great and, and uh, uh, impactful, potentially very impactful position there in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Detroit. We've got Grace Shaw, who's a co-founder of, of Warmaloo and lecturer uh, in the Center for Entrepreneurship. We have Moses Lee, who is a co-founder of Celio and um, former lecturer in the Center for uh, Entrepreneurship and uh, current owner of the Michigan Language uh, Institute, uh, Michigan Language Center. Uh, and then we have uh, Aaron Tarver, uh, who's the director of member marketing at Spring Health in New York City. Just moved back to New York from uh, uh, being in San Francisco since graduation from the Ross School of Business in 2011. And full disclosure, Aaron is my son. Okay, so uh, we've got uh, a great uh, and distinguished group of uh, guest reviewers. And also, again, we are honored to have uh, Christine Gordon joining us tonight. She's the academic director uh, in Center for Entrepreneurship. Okay. So every uh, session this uh, semester, we've started out just describing what we're doing uh, in the session and tonight is no different. So tonight uh, our student teams are gonna present their final business opportunity presentation to the teaching team and uh, to the urban entrepreneurship course uh, peers and to our urban entrepreneur partners. And again, of course, to our guest reviewers. And what are our objectives for the session tonight? This is like every other session we have learning objectives. And so uh, the objectives tonight are to deliver a high quality pitch style business opportunity presentation to answer the audience questions and receive a performance assessment and to review and assess the performances of their peers. So uh, that's what's happening uh, tonight. But before that, we have uh, a special treat. 
in that uh, we have the finals of something we call the perfect pitch. So one of the things that we wanted to do a couple of things this semester. One is, you know, given that we're remote, we wanted to get each, get to know each other. And I certainly wanted to know more about uh, the students who are in the class and have the students know more about each other. But beyond that, I wanted to see them and I wanted them to experience persuading people about something that they're already familiar with, that they're already comfortable with. And so we did that for four weeks. Uh, we had a group of students each week uh, present a one minute persuasive uh, pitch to the class. And each week we selected a winner and the winner got a few extra credit points. And uh, tonight we're gonna take the winners from those weekly sessions and present them all to everybody. And you will have a chance to vote on your overall winner. So this is gonna take about seven or eight minutes. And we're just gonna go through each of these uh, uh, winning presentations from the previous weeks and uh, have you uh, weigh in on who you think uh, was most persuasive and charismatic. And uh, so you might want to just, if you have a pencil, you might want to uh, just make a little note to yourself because it's going to, might be hard once you get to presentation number six to remember presentation number one. And so you might want to just say, yeah, hey, yeah, I like this one. Yeah, I like this one a little better, uh, you know, and, and kind of keep track as you go through them. So uh, let's see, we're going to start. I got to share a different application with you. Uh, let's see. There we go. Everybody see the Michigan logo and so forth? Okay, here we go. This is a perfect pitch session. Hi, my name is Ruthie and I'm here to tell you today why you should use reusable water bottles. Now, next time you go to Meyer and you get a rack of plastic water bottles, I want you to go home and start chewing on that plastic. And then two days later, I want you to check your shit because your body is like Mother Earth, unable to process the plastic that's put in its system. Now, you may be wondering, why should I give up my plastic water bottle for a reusable one? Well, reusable bottles are customizable to fit any style or need that you could possibly have. The corporations that own these plastic water bottles you're buying solely are trying to profit off of our basic human need and right to access to water. You can bring your reusable water bottle and fill it up for free instead of spending more money and benefiting these corporations. Now, you may also be wondering, well, why can't I just recycle my plastic water bottle? Well, in fact, only 91% of plastic that's put in the recycling bin actually ends up recycled. So instead of waste money and not have something to fit your personal style, you should stop using plastic water bottles and instead go reusable. Okay, that was uh, number one. That was Ruth. Ruth DeWitt, so uh, you want to just take a moment and uh, record your thoughts. Uh, and uh, we will start with presentation number two. Hi, everyone. My name is Steven, and today I'm going to be uh, convincing you that I can complete a crossbar challenge, which means I'll get that soccer ball from 18 yards out the edge of the penalty area on the soccer field and hitting the crossbar of that goal. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, to instill some confidence in you of me. I grew up playing soccer, played uh, four years competitively in high school, uh, and uh, my position was forward, which means uh, it was my job to score goals. I spent plenty of time around the goal. Uh, now, after high school, I didn't actually continue playing competitively, but I remained around the sport. I currently work for AFC Ann Arbor, which is a minor league soccer team in town, as well as in game presentation for the men's and women's soccer teams uh, at U of M. So I've got plenty of exposure to what good form looks like on the field. Uh, I know how much lift to get under the ball to get it to land perfectly on that crossbar. And on top of that, I'm wearing cleats today to uh, hopefully improve my performance there. So let's see if I can do this. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> that was uh, number two. That was Stephen Corcoran. Okay, take a moment, record your thoughts, and we will go to number three. Hello, Nassim. <laughs> Does the idea of cutting an onion leave you in tears? Do you suffer from bland food with no texture? Do your meals lack moisture? Well, I have the solution for you. Introducing the proper way to cut an onion so you never fear putting onions in your food again. With this onion cutting technique, you will shed less tears, keep your fingers safe, and chop faster than ever before. The key is in keeping the root of the onion attached throughout the whole cutting process. The onion expels some of its juice when you cut into it, which is what causes you to shed tears. By keeping the root attached, the onion expels less juice, so hopefully you don't have to add to the number of times you cried that day. Here you can see that the onion stays together while you cut it, which allows you to chop faster and more precisely. This is also why the technique is safer, because the knife and your fingers are less likely to slip. Now you're ready to use this onion cutting technique whenever you need to add some flavor and richness to your food. The best way is to cook the onions down with some oil and add your seasonings so they absorb all the flavor. Transform your cooking experience with the right way to cut onions. Okay, that was Agustina. And uh, that was number three. And so record your thoughts. And uh, now we will go to number four. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and I'm going to be convincing you on why you should figure out browns in. So I built it in, and I used a brown pencil from Beauty Supply, and that's the benefit of the linear eyebrows. It's not expensive at all, and you can get the effect that you want. My pencil only costs like two or three dollars, so you definitely can do that as well. And for the ladies, it definitely helps bring out your face more, make your face look more distinct, and it also can get you the guys, okay? Attract them with the brows, and then also it's easy to take off, so you could just wipe it off. See? At nighttime and then put them back on in the morning if you have time and it should not take you that long at all like i'll say a max three five minutes at most if you're doing it right so i think that's exactly why you ladies should fill in your eyebrows take it from me definitely a difference and that's what you definitely should do okay <laughs> that was jasmine jasmine johnson that was number four. Okay. Uh, and now we will go to presentation number five. If you record your thoughts. Okay. Hi, my name is Claire, and today I will be presenting why I should be the one who gets the extra credit points. So, for those of you who may not know, I am in nursing. I, up until this semester, I've been only studying things in nursing. So I went from learning how to set up IVs, how to give injections, giving medications, to trying to figure out what in the world a business on campus is. So while I am a very hard worker, needless to say, I have been struggling just a little bit in this class. Speaking of struggling, because nursing school has been so hard, my GPA is not looking the best, so any extra credit wouldn't hurt. And lastly, I would just like to end this by saying, wouldn't you want the extra credit points today to go to someone who could be potentially saving your life in the future? Think about that. Thank you. Okay, so that was uh, number five. That was Claire and uh, record your thoughts. And now we have the last uh, presentation, number six.
Hi guys, my name is Max Moore, and today I'm going to convince you to learn how to play the viola. First and foremost, the viola itself is an expertly crafted display of woodworking, and the art of making a viola has been passed down for centuries. Because of this, it's highly associated with high social class, highly wealthy, and highly cultured individuals, which I think are many things people aspire to have today. Moreover, it has this beautiful, deep, dark, rich tone that could captivate anybody. This is why I think you should learn how to play the viola. Okay, so that was it. Those are our six um, weekly winners. And um, I'm going to, uh, so first of all, let me just say, you can see that there is a, certainly a variety of uh, talent and variety of interests uh, in the class. And again, it was very, it's gratifying to see uh, all the things that uh, people are into every week. Uh, so, um, we have a little poll here. There are no losers here, but uh, somebody has got to be the winner. Uh, and so um, I'm going to launch the poll. And everybody can vote. Everybody can vote. Um, we're going to have our overall winner. We'll just take a minute to get everybody to make their selection. There's our results, people. It was a battle, but uh, congratulations to Mr. Mr. Moore. And uh, okay, so we're so on to the final presentations. This is the uh, this is the meat of the evening. All right, and uh, just to recap the instructor instructions for uh, uh, everybody. Um, uh, we're targeting 10 minutes, absolute maximum of 12 minutes for each presentation. So uh, Sonia will signal uh, the teams when there are 10 minutes expired, 11 minutes expired. When there are 12 minutes expired, we have to stop. Hopefully nobody will get to 12. Uh, we'll have five minutes maximum for questions and answers. Uh, again, because we have uh, uh, several teams and, and not a lot of time to spare, uh, we're asking that only our reviewers ask questions. Um, and if our urban entrepreneur partners want to clarify anything about the presentation, you, you guys are in communication already anyway with the team. So you can do that uh, outside of the uh, presentations. But we're limiting the Q and A to our uh, reviewers, um, and we probably only have time for two or three questions per presentation. Q and A's. Uh, use the Google form that we provided for scoring the presentation, uh, and uh, what we're asking you to do again is to consider your overall impression of the presentation. How does it hit you? How do you feel about it? You can certainly consider those factors that uh, we included on the assessment form, but I don't want you to get bogged down in the specifics of problem, solution, business model, so forth. I just want you to take in, based on your own expertise and your own feeling, how do you feel about that presentation? How would you grade it from one to 10? Uh, from As far as a parametric review, uh, I have the video. And so the teaching team, after the presentations, we can go through the video and make sure that each of the teams hit the points that we uh, wanted them to hit. But as far as uh, our reviewers, we just want you to, to uh, grade it on how this presentation impacted you. If you feel like this is a, a great business opportunity and if it was presented well. Uh, and uh, uh, even one or two comments left uh, in the comments section on the review form will be helpful uh, to the teams as they go forward. So if you could just leave one or two of your main comments about the, uh, the performance. If everybody does that, we'll have a bunch of comments uh, for each team. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the order of presentations, we're gonna start with 
uh, Macking Torch Africa. We're going to go to Ride Scoozy, then Yum Village. We're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Let everybody catch their breath. Uh, you can, again, upgrade your up, update your forms, your assessment and whatnot if you want to do that. And then we'll have the final three uh, presentations. I want I, I want to point out two things. One is that uh, uh, you can go back on the form if you need to. Just go back uh, to a, a previous section if you want to go back and change something. Also, even after you submit uh, the assessment form, you're going to get an email saying you submitted it. There'll be a link in there. If you want to go into that link and go back in and change anything that you submitted. Uh, you can do it there. So don't feel like what you uh, put down was the absolute uh, final. We'll give you another 10 or 15 minutes after everything is done to uh, uh, go back and uh, update your uh, responses if you want to do that. Uh, so afterwards, we'll give you a few minutes to wrap up and submit the responses and uh, then we'll adjourn. So that's the, that's the program for tonight. Okay. I see we're already running behind. So here we go. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to start with uh, Macintosh Africa, and I'm just going to uh, allow them to share their screen. Hello. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Hi, my name is Claire Lee. Uh, my team consisting of Paul, Agustina, Amin, Max, and I had the pleasure of working with Macintosh Africa this semester. So Macintosh Africa is a social impact company focused on sustainability initiatives. And in this presentation, we'll be going further into what makes Macintosh a unique opportunity. But before we get started, we'd like to give a big thank you to Mr. McAfee Awuku for dedicating so much time and energy into this course. It was a pleasure working with him and we look forward to seeing Macintosh's impact and growth in the coming years. So the problem right now is that international consumers don't have direct ways to fight against environmental concerns. Um, during a critical time like now, consumers don't feel like they're making a meaningful impact and they want a low commitment solution to spread awareness. So with the rapidly declining state of the environment, people want to take part in finding a solution, but they don't have the means. So how can they do so? Next slide, please. Macintosh gives consumers the power to shape the future of plastic in the environment through their purchase from a range of products made from recycled plastic. Each time you purchase a Macintosh product, you are removing from the environment the harmful plastic waste that has gone into making your item. Further, a portion of your profits from your purchase are used to fund community projects in Ghana, which aim to reframe the ways people consume and dispose of plastic and educate on the importance of sustainable living. These projects enable members of various communities in Ghana to reduce the level of plastic waste in their local environments. This reduction of plastic waste in Ghana means that less plastic will enter global waterways and we as a global community will be one step closer to a plastic waste free earth. Next slide, please. Macintosh aims to create a movement that collectively helps remove plastic waste from the environment and advocates for sustainable lifestyles. Their movement is easy to join. With simply a purchase of a Macintosh product, you are already making a change in your own life towards more sustainable living and helping rid the planet of plastic waste. By choosing their durable, high quality footwear and home products, you are further reducing your consumption habits because these products are made to last in contrast to many competing options these days with purposefully short lifespans that get quickly thrown away and contribute to the overproduction of waste. Macintosh's community projects are what make them unique as a company because they enable your purchase to go even further in helping reduce plastic waste on our planet. We see the Macintosh business model as one that is scalable and adaptable for communities all around the globe. As Macintosh grows, we hope to see future entrepreneurs adopting our business model in their own communities, as this will have a compounding effect on the presence of plastic in our natural environment. Next slide, please.
Magna Kuyaluku is the founder and CEO of Magna Torch, and he's also one of the first people to develop a sustainable solution like this in Accra. Um, his vision and motivation came from the lack of environmental literacy in Ghana, as well as the lack of infrastructure for plastic waste in the city. Um, as of now, there are 11 other individuals who make up the core team and advisory board, and most of the work is done by volunteers from the local community. Uh, currently, McAfee is looking to hire a full team of employees. Next slide, please. So the next step is to enlist more people from the U.S. to join to the mission to create a cleaner environment and make a more positive impact in Africa and beyond. Uh, through customer interviews, we've come to the realization that many people in the U.S. would be more interested in taking part in the movement that Mac and Torch is pioneering. Uh, in the United States, we have the privilege to care about the environment. Um, people will want to feel like they're doing good and actually making a difference. So by emphasizing the potential to consumers that their purchases can make a direct impact on the environment in Africa and beyond, will give consumers the feeling that they're actually making a positive impact while making them feel good about their purchase. Next slide. With the power of e-commerce and a guerrilla marketing approach, Macintosh can reach a new customer segment that is extremely promising. This customer segment is consumers in the United States who are concerned about climate change and want to make changes in their consumption habits with the intention of living a more sustainable life. Surveys of the market for sustainable consumer goods show a consistent trend of growth at a current rate of 3.5% and is, it is expected to grow to $150 by the end of 2021. We believe that Macintosh has the ability to break into this market through the use of targeted social media advertisements to sustainably minded consumers. This approach has proven effective for other companies similar to Macintosh. For example, For Ocean, a company that sells bracelets made from recycled plastic for which a portion of proceeds are used to fund beach and ocean cleanup efforts. Four Ocean spends millions of dollars on social media advertisements, which has enabled their massive growth in recent years. To give you a picture of Four Ocean's ad spending, they were the 14th largest purchaser of ad space on Facebook. We believe that Macintosh's business model would benefit greatly from a marketing approach similar to Four Ocean, with a guerrilla style approach where viable consumers would be frequently served Macintosh ads in order to gain exposure and be at the forefront of consumers' minds when they go to make sustainable purchases. To make this happen, we recommend that Macintosh find a partner that feels passionate about the mission and who holds the skills and knowledge necessary to be able to target consumers in the United States with advertisements on platforms like Instagram and Facebook. Next slide, please. Macintosh Africa can have a global reach. Um, First off, uh, Macintosh Africa. Macintosh Africa is a part of the environmental awareness industry, which we thought um, meant any uh, person that seeks uh, to raise awareness against environmental injustice locally or internationally. Um, current, the current market for uh, Macintosh is in the introduction phase, as there uh, are many people around the world who want to feel like they're advocating against environmental injustice, but they they can't at the moment. Um, and because they're at, because at the moment it's only able to reach a smaller market, um, Magatorch has a lot of room for growth, and hopefully it will make the transition from introduction to another um, another stage in the market shortly. And then, uh, as you see on the side here, there's a uh, it's a projected growth of um, of the sustainable product sales in the US. Um, so you could see that um, the the market is definitely growing in countries like the US. Um, how can our business be sustainable? Um, firstly, through customer inter interviews, um, we have seen that uh, we have seen that um, the uh, cost for the shoes are about fifty bucks because of shipping, um, and that generated uh, five thousand in re revenue uh, from three hundred fifty pairs of shoes. Um, the cost of the shoes to produce. Um, for manufacturing is about eight dollars, and um, there's the three uh, revenue streams for Macintosh are the uh, non-government organizations, uh, government initiatives, and also um, support from international customers. And then, as you can see in the next slide, um, this is the um, the distribution of the three revenue streams, and we hope in the future that we can. Uh, 
increase the international con customers percentage of this of the revenue stream. And then uh, Market Torch's unique attitude towards competition, it actually embraces competition because in addition to um, innovating their product, the uh, having more competition brings a positive ag aggregate impact to the fight against uh, plastic waste. And then in addition to revenue funds, uh, in addition to the revenue funds helping Ghanaian communities, um, is also a first first market store in a uh, in a uh, Accra. So it's it's a, a beginning. It's beginning uh, the market in Accra. And then lastly, it's also a scalable and adaptable model. As we as in the long term, uh, there's a plan for there to be franchising of this company to other other companies with marketing advice and also um, sustainability technologies. So we're confident that the Making Torch Africa business model is successful. We believe that the next step is gathering more customers and building the Making Torch Africa community. Through improving their shipping channels, Making Torch Africa can make their international shipping costs lower, which in turn will make Making Torch Africa products more accessible to consumers. Additionally, adopting a social media marketing strategy similar to the Four Oceans model mentioned earlier will help to bolster Making Torch Africa's influence. Lastly, expanding research capabilities to gather more data about the customer segments will allow for a better allocation of resources. Through taking these steps, we're confident that Making Torch Africa can improve upon its already successful business model. Next slide, please. Okay, this wraps up our presentation. Thank you for listening and thanks to Makufuli for all of his time, dedication and guidance. And thank you to Professor Tarver for all of your help as well. Thanks again. All right, uh, thank you. That was uh, 10 minutes on the dot. <laughs> uh, so uh, questions, any questions for the Macintosh team? You have a question about the shoes. Um, have you been able to touch, feel, and see the product, or are you just talking about how you've seen it online and maybe interviewed some people in Ghana? Is that correct, or people, or were you interviewing people in the United States who had actually purchased the shoe or the sandal? Um, I can answer that question. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to obtain a pair of the sandals um, by this time um, due to the pandemic um, and like really long shipping times from Ghana. We were afraid that they would not arrive on time. Um, but McAfee was able to provide a lot of details to us about what goes into these shoes, as well as describing the various features of them. Um, and he provided us with some pretty in-depth photos. Um, and then for our customer interviews, we focused on interviewing um, potential customers here in the US uh, because that's where we thought we would be able to provide um, the most help to McAfee. Okay, Thank and maybe question. Th that was helpful. And just out of curiosity, do you think there actually needs to be a change in the product at all to adapt to an American consumer and even foot size and shape and weight? Yeah. Um, I, I don't personally think so. Um, the sandals that, uh, he sells are very similar to the popular Birkenstock sandals, um, that are like very in style these days, but instead of using animal leather or similar materials, um, they make a leather like material out of, uh, plastic, out of recycled plastic. Um, so we thought that the product itself was very, um, appropriate for markets here in the US. And he has uh, a large size range, um, including youth sizes, um, and then all the way up to adult sizes. So um, that also increases the amount of customers that we think would be interested in these shoes. Okay. okay. Thanks. Oh, for so oh, go ahead. Sorry, James. No, no. You go ahead. Thanks for answering the um, product related questions because I wanted to ask you about that, like whether you've touched or felt or seen them. Um, when you look at the, you mentioned that this company, their business model is looking really great, that they were the 14th largest purchaser of ad space on Facebook. 
what was that return on their advertising investment? How much revenue did it lead to? How do you know that the business model is successful? Um, I do not have those numbers uh, off the top of my head, um, but from the research we did into For Ocean, um, we saw that when they start, when they increase their ad spending, um, they actually gained a larger customer base. And in recent years, with the improvement of targeted social media advertisements and the ability to better hone in on a specific customer segment, um, they experienced even more growth than at the beginning stages of their company. Um, so unfortunately, I can't provide you with the exact number of revenue or like a percentage of growth um, that this led them to. But from the research that we did, um, their marketing methods, specifically with targeted ads, were very successful. Um, and we think that this is due to the sustainability aspect of the products um, and how consumers um, are drawn to the potential to do good with their purchase. Uh, okay, perfect. Follow on question, um, and then I'll pass it to James. So you mentioned that they, um, Four Oceans had a very successful targeted ad campaign and that they had more customers based on their increase in spend. When you did your um, review of the percent revenue from, generated from each channel, how would you anticipate if, you know, um, if the startup was going to move forward, who would be their best customer segment? Would it be government organizations, international customers, or non-governmental organizations? Um, great question. Um, we think that the customer segment of international consumers, um, those specifically with sustainable mindsets, has the potential to be their largest revenue source um, because we believe that there is almost an unlimited share of people who are looking to make sustainable um, changes in their life. And especially as the climate crisis wor like worsens, we think that there are gonna be more people who are trying to make these small sustainable changes in their life. So um, we predict that that customer segment has the potential to be their largest um, once they implement these changes that we have recommended. Thanks. Thank you. All right, last question, James. I don't wanna to be too far I'm assuming here, but I'm assuming that the plastic to shoe conversion model in Africa made sense because it solved the problem. It solved two problems in Africa. Is, is, am I correct in assuming that? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, okay, so when you get outside of that market, particularly looking at international consumers, if it's not a necessity-based thing for me for shoes and I'm more of a style shoe purchaser, I like the model, how do I Page, like what other than shoes do you have to offer me to participate? And, and, and particularly because I think the slide said 68% of your purchase right now was your uh, NGOs. That's not something that's going to really pan out from a value-based perspective if you're trying to actually attract consumers. So what are the thoughts around how this, like either how the shoes be mar become marketable or what other products the plastics can convert into that has consumer appeal? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I was not no worries. Um, well, yeah, I just wanted to give, <laughs> yeah, of course. I wanted to give other people on my team an opportunity um, to maybe chip in. Um, but we think that um, the kind of like what's going to attract international customers um, is more so Macintosh's mission and the good that um, the, like your, your purchase can do um, in Africa um, for people in those communities who are learning about sustainability and learning about how to be responsible with plastic waste. Um, but more so about the product itself, we think that there is a big potential for some of Macintosh's other products, which include like tote bags or backpacks or like 
small, um, like kind of like pencil case type pouches um, where that would be at a cheaper price point and more possibly valuable to other customers. Um, like you said, maybe some who choose shoes more from a fashionable standpoint. Um, so we think that once they get into this targeting, um, the, we hope that they'll be able to figure out how, um, which consumers would be interested in shoes based on their purchasing habits and which consumers would be more interested in some of Macintosh's other products. Um, and then really nailing home um, like how, how much their purchase is impacting people's lives in Africa and also how the shoes or the products themselves take a portion of plastic out of the environment. All right, that, uh, our time is up for questions, but uh, those are some really good questions. And um, maybe you guys, while, while they're uh, uh, doing their uh, assessment, can put up a picture of uh, one of these shoes. These are some stylish looking shoes. They're not, uh, they're not low end. Um, but at any rate, um, we'll give you a couple minutes to wrap up your assessments. Hi, everybody. We're Ride Scoozy, and we're going to talk about a better way to commute. Now, let's meet the team. I'm Skylar Frank. I'm Jacob Friedman. I'm Jordan Leff. I'm Anthony Alexander. And I'm Taylor Antes. Typically, in many large cities, students, as well as urban professionals, face a multitude of difficulties when commuting. Cities are plagued by very congested streets and traffic. In addition, public transportation is very unsanitary and an unreliable form of travel. Car ownership can be very expensive, let alone the additional costs associated with parking in a large urban city. That leads us into the question, how can these urban residents avoid inefficient means of public and private transportation? Taylor is about to touch on some of the reasons why electric bikes are the answer. Thank you, Jordan. Oops, excuse me. Sorry, I'm a little too excited. So um, kind of what Jordan said, we're going to talk about um, electric commuter bicycles in general, for those of you who don't quite know. So these bicycles are very small, they're compact, and some of the key innovations of them is that they have effortless and sanitary travel, especially during this unprecedented time with COVID-19. You want to have as much private transportation as you can. And if you're not able to afford a car or something of that nature, these are a great option to get from point A to point B. Kind of along that same line, it enables a flexible schedule for you to go to your destination, whether that's a school or to work, wherever it may be, at any time you need. And when you go there, you'll have great outdoor engagement, which is just great in general. So as you think about it, you think, why ride Scoozy? So ride Scoozy's key innovation for this is that the bikes are very full. The foldability of the bikes is very good. They fold down to a 35 by 19 by 29 inch bicycle, which for reference is able to fit under your office desk or in your closet door. So whenever you're not using them, it can be safely stored away. These bikes have a 30 to 50 mile range and a three to five hour battery life. And as I mentioned, the foldability is one of the key aspects and along with the ability to ride at night due to the LED lights. They're a supreme rider experience and have supreme customer support. And not only that, when the bike comes to you, it's 99% assembled, so there's not much that you have to do. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Anthony. Thank you, Taylor. So how do you get to this Ride Scoozy bike? First, initial customer uses the Ride Scoozy website provided on a platform by GoDaddy which he or she is able to browse through different products. Once the customer finds one that he likes or she likes and fits their best needs, the transaction can be completed thanks to Shopify. The bike parts are picked by Jason from specific manufacturers. And then thanks to a simple net, assembled network partner in China, the bikes are assembled and dropped off in US ready to go. The bikes are then stored in a warehouse with many other spare parts. And once a product is purchased, FedEx, another key partner, is there to pick the product up and already packaged and sealed and then delivered to the front door of the customer, leaving the customer very happy. Now, Jacob, we'll talk about the market industry. Thank you, Anthony. So I want to discuss uh, a little bit about the e-bike industry. Um, as you can see from this graph, the e-bike industry 
uh, is growing in part to growing traffic problems, um, like Taylor mentioned, as well as fear of global emissions. Um, that being said, there's also key market forces that impact a company like Riot Scuzi. Um, e-bike companies often use a bike assembler who's responsible for collecting the parts as well as manufacturing the bike, uh, giving, the, um, giving the electric bike company very little bargaining power. Um, so that's why, sorry, that's why it has a high supplier power, uh, why there exists a high supplier power. Um, also, competitive rivalry is high. Bike companies are often pushing to make product advancements and efficiency and performance. This is actually what differentiates Ride Scuzi from most of its competitors because um, it focuses so much on uh, performance, um, as well as advertising campaigns to help differentiate one provider to another. Uh, there's also a high threat of entry due to low entry costs in the market. This has resulted in a multitude of personal electric vehicles that exist within the market. I'm going to pass it along to Skyler. He's going to talk to you about scalability. Yeah, so as a potential investor, the main thing you care about is, well, what kind of profit can I look at or can I look to make? And when we begin to take a look at the revenue of Ride Scuzi, it's really important to speak in terms of scalability. You know, over the past four years, Ride Scuzi has seen their sales increase by about 40% yearly, which, as you can imagine, is extremely significant. And specifically over the last year, the company saw its first, first year with seven figures in revenue. And with a profit margin of 2020 to 25%, a potential, as a potential investor, it's extremely easy to see, you know, the current profitability of Ride Scuzi and the future as Ride Scuzi scales. You know, and with this, all these high uh, market characteristics and uh, the difficulties for uh, many bike companies to get into the market, it's important to for us to assess our competitive advantage. And as we've already talked about a little bit, the assembler network is extremely important. These assemblers uh, are very difficult to get a hold of. And without taking multiple trips to China, Jason would really struggle to reach out to these partners and gain insight into their businesses and develop relationships. So while there's a very high threat to entry in the market, there are some very high barriers to reach out to these assemblers. On top of this, we've already touched on it before, but the product quality of Rad Scuzzi bikes is extremely good compared to the rest of the market. The engineering that was done at Ride Scuzzi to determine the best parts and ensure the smoothest ride for uh, customers can really not be matched by many of the competitors. And Ride Scuzzi does this for about half the price of many of the other uh, companies on the market. Um, so myself uh, and my team participated in multiple customer discovery interviews uh, with the goal of discovering uh, if additional customer segments exist uh, as well as if we could grow Ride Scoozy's channel options. Um, first, on the customer segment side, we reached out to two customer segments to discover uh, if it was a, if it was a, if it was feasible for us to market to them, um, college students as well as urban working professionals. Uh, when interviewing students, uh, we found that this segment already does participate in e-transport. I'm sure you're familiar with Spins, Birds. Boaz bikes. Uh, it's often a student-led. Uh, it's also it's often a student mode of transportation. Um, they also show a promising interest in personal electric transportation. Um, however, in order to reach this segment, uh, we need to focus on answering all the key desires of these students. Um, so our interviewees, our sorry, our interviewees touched on a need for compact uh, a need for a compact transportation option um, due to, you know, limited storage space and no additional revenue for access to storage. Taylor kind of harped on that earlier in the presentation. Um, also we know students are often always on a budget, um, you know, and are tight on cash. Um, so it may be necessary to implement payment plans like a subscription, um, you know, or a multi-month plan in order to make that one time initial investment more feasible for students. Uh, lastly, students enjoy participating in environmental activism uh, and want to see the positive impact of choosing an electric transportation uh, bike over, you know, like a gas vehicle, um, which we could potentially relay data to them in order to kind of help them see their carbon footprint. Um, next, we also reached out to urban working class professionals, see the key desires in personal transportation in order to market to them. Uh, we found similarly to students um, that due to living in urban situations, this, seg this segment needs compact and lightweight options uh, in order for it to be a logical investment for them. 
Um, if you think like a individual living in an urban uh, city often lives in a high rise apartment, um, making it you know difficult to uh, you know sometimes having to climb upstairs and uh, you know being in a compact area needing you know a lightweight option to store inside their apartment. Also, there's expensive storing uh, storage options and uh, you know parking options within the city um, that make it not feasible. Um, luckily, Rise Scoozy's foldable and lightweight frame that Taylor mentioned earlier answers this uh, problem. We also managed to ask these individuals on their purchasing preferences and found a potential new channel option. Um, so currently, Ride Scoozy uses website sales as well as Amazon in order to sell their product. Um, however, in the interviews we had, we found that interviewees like to see an expensive product in person before buying, um, such as $500 or over and given the uh, cheapest model Ride Scoozy offers is around $1,000. Uh, we thought a, a better way to answer this would be uh, to roll out a brick and mortar store. Um, and then, sorry, excuse me. Customers can then face, uh, can then be face to face with the product. The product can actually sell itself rather than seeing it on a uh, computer uh, or a you know, mobile phone. Also salesmen can answer any press pressing questions uh, that the consumer may have, making them more confident about purchasing the bike. Um, and going forward with that. I'm going to pass it on to Skylar. Uh, he's going to talk about the future of Ride Scoozy. Yeah, so when we started looking at uh, taking Ride Scoozy to the next level in terms of growth, we saw four main avenues to uh, do this. Uh, first of which, just being general advertising to increase product awareness. Uh, something we didn't touch upon very much uh, when we were doing customer interviews was the fact that a lot of these older urban working class residents were just very unaware of the electric bike market as a whole, especially as you got older, you know, up into people in their early or uh, late 30s and early 40s, people just didn't really know what electric bikes offer. They're asking like very simple questions, which could have been answered by, you know, just doing a little research, but they just weren't really aware. So just some general product awareness would definitely take the electric bike market to the next level. On top of this, as we transition, as a company transitions to using commuter bikes, we need to access a younger customer segment. So uh, ads on Twitter and Instagram where younger people frequent more would definitely be beneficial to get out of these younger customers. On top of this, increase branding on the bikes themselves by adding a logo and the company's name would definitely be beneficial. Just uh, so that when you know people are buying these bikes and riding them around, you get some free marketing. And then, yeah, whether it be a brick and mortar uh, store of Ride Scoozy itself or getting the product within stores, a lot of these uh, customers when making this larger purchase are really wary of doing these online. And so they wanna, yeah, let the product sell itself. So moving forward, um, in order to implement the solutions that we've discussed, obviously additional capital will be required for change, uh, for um, rolling out a brick and mortar store as well as launching marketing and advertising campaigns to the new additional customer segments. Um, and looking at a time frame, we believe that the marketing uh, and uh, marketing and advertising campaigns uh, could be rolled out within the year, but obviously there can be additional time for a new uh, brick and mortar channel, as well as there would be uh, additional payroll expenses for additional departments on the marketing side, as well as the in-store employees. Um, yeah, oh, and you can go, yeah. We'd like to uh, say a special thank you to uh, Mr. Habiger, who is our UEP partner and owner of Ride Scoozy, Professor Tarver, Sonia, uh, as well as Reggie Barnett um, for all their hard work and help. Um, and we open the floor to questions. Thank you so much. Okay, questions. I'll jump in. Um, so we're at 25% profit margins and we want to go brick and mortar. Um, how are we going to pay for that? Uh, and is there in your outlines, your needs, one of the things I was looking to see was a path to increasing those margins, like a point at which you either scale operations and create some efficiencies where your cost to produce each unit goes down. Um, and then my second question will be about your competitive landscape. Where do you where does your price point sit now? And is there a point at which you can become either more competitive or, or at least have a bit more profitability? Yeah, so, I, so as for the first question, 
Uh, as we begin to get more revenue or take on an initial investor, we can start purchasing these, uh, our bikes in larger quantities from the assemblers. And that can uh, you know, increase our profitability based on just order size and then also size of shipping. You know, from someone like FedEx where you get a uh, decreased uh, price for that, for you know, a larger order. And then uh, yeah, as we continue with that, we can see a brick and mortar store being beneficial just purely because it's very hard to distinguish online. When you see a cheaper product, you just immediately assume uh, a worse product unless you know you have experience with a brand. So we think that just getting people in store and like seeing and touching and actually riding these bikes will see that you know we are offering a better product for a lower price. Yeah, and then also to kind of add on that as well. Um, yes, kind of, which is a great question and kind of how to increase those profit margins. Um, kind of, as we mentioned, uh, in the middle, not necessarily the middle, but sometime during the semester when Jason was really relaying the fact that he was moving from recreational bikers as his market to that of the urban working class and also the students, we believe that it increased the market size much more for us. So then we would be able to sell at a higher volume. So then at that point, even if the profit margins did not same, we'd be selling more of them so that we could eventually expand into that brick and mortar type of store. Any additional questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I went to their website and looked at a lot of the existing photos of customers. It does appear to be a, um, a more of a older, less mobile population that would buy these bikes because I mean, I'm just curious if like, I'm just thinking maybe the customers you interviewed potentials would prefer a mountain bike for its exercise and their ability to continue to use a bike that they can pedal versus an electric bike. Just because looking at the photos, it does seem like they're targeting an older population with their product. Did you get any feedback on that when you did your customer interviews or thoughts? Is this competing with a traditional mountain bike in the segment that you're looking to expand into? Yeah, and that, that's also a great question as well. It's funny you say that. I, uh, in one of the customer discovery interviews, um, a good friend of my dad's back home owns a, one of the oldest bicycle stores in our city. Um, it's kind of a smaller city, but I had a conversation with him as our discovery interview and one of his main clients who a lot of them are older and kind of the pedaling types that you see. And the specific one that I talked to said that he used to ride a ton in a sense that he began to kind of not being able to cut or keep up physically, I should say, he did have an electric bike and he said he absolutely loved it. He had a friend group who had one and it was just really great in general for them to still get out. And this is kind of the, the market change that we were referring to. So on that website, we were talking more so about the um, older population as recreational bikers, but especially with us kind of having the student mindset and, and the, especially the increase uh, as seen in the graph of, the birds and the uh, spins and electric vehicles in general that will get you from point A to point B in a convenient fashion. We think that it's very easily expandable for us to get into those type of markets. Um, and I know a lot of us also kind of talk with, um, in our second rounds especially, the recent graduates in big cities. Um, now, a lot of people on the East Coast, because of the weather, had not heard much of it because they couldn't use this uh, season, excuse me, year long because of the seasons. But a lot of people who, especially I interviewed, and I know a couple interviewed Google and Facebook and Microsoft, the companies that are out West, they see a lot of electric bicycles because they are kind of a young, hip thing to do to get, um, not show up to work sweating, that type of deal. And they really have seen a lot of them at every block on the West Coast. All right, we're really uh, up against our time limit uh, for this uh, section. So uh, I would ask, uh, uh, you all to uh, take a couple minutes, take a few minutes and uh, record your assessment. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Ramos and I will be joined by Jade Bosch, Madison Buford. I'm Stephen Corcoran. And I'm Ruthie DeWitt. That being said, today we will be going through Young Village, an African raised Detroit made Afro Caribbean fast casual restaurant. We will provide a market analysis and recommendations from our student team. This presentation is made with special thanks to Godwin, the chef, owner, and operator of Yum Village. That being said, let's dive into the problem. From Godwin's perspective, there needs to be an affordable option for people that is healthy, sustainable, and convenient. 
In the fast casual industry in Detroit, there's a lack of options where quality and healthiness meets convenience and speed and where culture and authentic offerings meet easy accessibility. Currently, most food spots are quick, but not of quality. Restaurant diversity is limited with little representation of African cuisines for curious consumers. There's essentially a lack of options for those looking for an experience out of their food choices of quality and convenience for African-American Detroiters that are looking for culturally authentic food choices, as well as for consumers who still demand quality, healthiness, and convenience in unique cuisine. Fast food, fast food restaurants are fast casual, but not of quality. That being said, um, let's jump into why Yum Village. Yum Village benefits from having a second generation Nigerian and authentic chef at the helm. It's black owned with local roots. Additionally, the restaurant stands behind its slogan, African raised Detroit made. The fusion of authentic cuisine with Americanized elements may be more palatable to new potential customers. Let's meet the team. Godwin is the chef, owner, and operator, and our awesome entrepreneurship partner this semester. Having Godwin at the helm is crucial to the Yum Village team in terms of its organization and enthusiasm within the restaurant. Yum Village's small team includes about half African immigrants joined in union with its American employees. The chef that brings knowledge and expertise to food production offer high value to the operation of the restaurant. One hole in the team that could be filled is a digital platform manager, which we'll be discussing later in our presentation. Now, you may be wondering, who loves Yum Village? Well, besides Professor Tarver, Yum Village primarily serves the female cultural traveler, a 22 to 48 year old woman that is not satisfied with a simple routine diet. She is curious about international cuisines and is quality minded, generally seeking out healthy foods. Secondarily, the restaurant serves people in the African diaspora in Detroit. These folks lack quality options for ethnic foods outside the home, and they also lack the potential to connect on a cultural level through food and to build on their customer experience. Yum Village's immediately serviceable market is the new center Detroit neighborhood, which has approximately 1500 people with a 25 minute delivery radius determined by their delivery partners, such as Grubhub, Uber Eats and Postmates. In theory, scaling and franchising could begin to service the greater Metro Detroit area, which consists of 4.3 million people with the total area with demand for fast casual food being much larger. Yum Village sees a low threat from direct Afro-Caribbean competitors with higher danger coming from indirect substitutes that rely less on niche goods that are often more expensive, attracting their potential buyers with lower prices, although paired with lower quality ingredients. So focusing on the business model, it's important to look at the revenue, website appeal, and the digital footprint. Currently, 85% of Young Village's revenue comes from online sales due to shifts with the pandemic. However, the business's traditional revenue sources center around restaurant sales, as well as purchases of market goods from the on-premise on commissary. The main channel for engagement, the website, has now become crucial for sales. We believe that having a larger digital footprint that has better engagement with followers would help create a base of customers and further expand Yum Village. So looking at our proposed solutions and benefits. I believe that the next step should be to revamp the website design, social media strategies, and provide digital support. This will improve engagement with followers and keep Yum Village at the top of mind in the community. Using social media to create a space to advertise and communicate with the customer is crucial. Lastly, we recommend offering an intern position for digital support and social media engagement. Young Village should establish a relationship with Wayne State University for marketing internships. This would allow Godwin as the founder to stay operation focused, giving the digital responsibility to someone who is tech savvy to bring consistency to the branding while saving on personnel costs. So looking at our Instagram templates, we recommended a few changes. The current images are great, but just adding uh, more in-depth descriptions that are both brief and compelling would help attract the cultural travelers that we're really trying to get to. This keeps the restaurant top of mind if done consistently and frequently. Now this template is applicable for all sorts of types of posts. 
we can highlight a new product in its background, highlight human interest shots, such as behind the scenes and uh, news and events. And this can be done on Facebook as well as Instagram. Now, digital marketing is currently underutilized by Young Village, and we think Instagram is perfect for visualizing and informing people about products. We can continue to grow online sales through targeted local advertising on social media. And now Steven's gonna talk about the website. All right, thank you, Cade. Uh, as Cade mentioned, I'm gonna uh, shift our focus a little bit to uh, what the website looks like right now. Uh, as you see on the screen, uh, we have uh, Godwin's uh, Square uh, uh, Square website for, uh, for online ordering, uh, separate from their main website. Uh, now, Square offers quality backgrounds for uh, their a la carte items uh, with uh, visually appealing images paired with um, backgrounds on each item and even history with things like jerk chicken, jollof rice, and uh, sweet and spicy plantains, which uh, all make up the classic village combo that you can see on the left here. Uh, but as you can tell, uh, this information is not as easily reachable on their uh, main Detroit Hot Bowls menu. So we believe that these pages should hold the interest of curious web browsers in the same way as the a la carte items do. And you uh, don't see it on the screen now, but the main website lacks the same info. Uh, the menu on the main website separate from Square is a, a single image. And it, uh, we believe it should have a section by section uh, approach with uh, item backgrounds like the a la carte menu that you see on the right here. And again, uh, the professional photo shoot visuals are perfect for drawing in new buyers, but access to this information on uh, unique foods, uh, in this case in the African uh, setting, should be really effortless when influencing the online cultural travelers' consuming behaviors. Now, Young Village holds competitive advantages uh, both in product and experience, uh, focusing on high quality of food as well as healthiness and overall uniqueness. Uh, and we believe that uh, by exploring uh, their digital potential, uh, cementing uh, Young Village's digital footprint on multiple channels, uh, Godwin will be able to demonstrate the product quality in a more um, uh, demonstrable way uh, and stay top of mind for potential uh, cultural traveler consumers that may just be browsing and uh, need extra reminders, consistent reminders that Young Village is the perfect opportunity for dine-in or takeout. Now there's a lot of information on the financial side on the screen, but I wanna draw your attention to the top right on personnel specifically. As Cade mentioned previously, uh, bringing an intern into the uh, a digital media intern into the Young Village team uh, would add value to the uh, to the overall team uh, function and uh, uh, allow uh, Godwin to step away from the digital side of things and uh, focus on operations while saving on these personnel costs and uh, augmenting the overall digital footprint uh, has the potential to increase. Uh, the uh, rate of return for customers at Young Village, whether it be in-house or online ordering uh, from the current 15 to 30% uh, per 30 day period that we see on the right hand side here. And now Madison will bring it home for us. Thank you, Steven. So basically, um, I was talk, tasked talking about the customer discovery interviews. Um, basically, what we did was we went out and interviewed people that were part of our customer segments, people we thought would be part of our customer segments, to kind of gauge the reaction to Young Village. So things that we found out for sure were that, one, there was a cultural traveler um, that fits the description that was mentioned earlier by my great partner, Ruthie. And secondly, there is an African-American interest in the community. Um, other things that we learned from our customer discovery discovery interviews where um, supporting local businesses is still important even despite the pandemic, people aren't going outside. Um, a lot of um, fast food, fast casual frequenters like the, having the option to be healthy, oops, sorry, <laughs> to be healthy and um, have like having the option to make a decision to eat healthier. And then the customers do genuinely appreciate new flavors, spiciness and you know seasoned food, which I think everyone likes, I guess. Um, going to the next slide. Um, 
Lastly, the summary for the next steps for Young Village are basically like Stephen and everyone else has mentioned, changing the structure, not the structure, but adding more information to the website to make sure that we're um, being appealing to our customer segments, hiring a digital intern to really give Young Village that marketing flair that it needs to push it into another, another stratosphere and also um, making sure that there is um, information added for the calendar year so that people can see what's going on and be updated with Young Village. Um, again, special thanks to um, our partner, um, Godwin. He couldn't be here tonight, but really grateful for him. Thank you, Dr. Um, Professor Tarver. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, uh, Young Village team. Questions? I, I have a question. So uh, with so much focus being on how to improve the website and the visual footprint, um, either by working with Godwin or um, I don't know if you all have insight into the analytics of his current website, but curious if you know uh, what the current drop off is of visitors hitting the website uh, that are failing to convert and actually uh, placing orders and um, what the improvement in that conversion you would anticipate uh, with a lot of these improvements that you had outlined. Uh, oh, go ahead, Steven. Absolutely, Madison, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, so the technical numbers for the um, drop off we do not have. Um, with the changes being made to our marketing, I think that it would increase just because having an ability to know what you're buying um, and be able to connect with that if possible, I think is a really important part. So like if I just gave you something that you had no idea about, I'm like, oh, here, try this. It's very hard to kind of like connect or even want to have the curiosity to want to buy these things. So by adding the different flares for marketing and also the extra information, it allows people to, uh, you know, be able to either research more into the cuisine that they're looking into because I do know that from my customer just customer discovery interview um one of the people I interviewed one year was saying how when he was catering food he he likes to know what's going into the food how it's being made and things of that nature so having that knowledge is I definitely will be an, an increase in people um having that turnover rate if that answered your question I hope it did yeah, and I'll, I'll add a little more. Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Aaron. As Madison mentioned, we don't have uh, direct access to the back end of the website. Uh, so we don't have those numbers at the moment. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up. We should definitely have that conversation with Godwin. Um, but at the moment, uh, what we can say is through discovery, uh, customer discovery and our interviews with uh, several people, the uh, rate of purchase uh, has dropped significantly because of the pandemic, even though he is still open for operation, still open to uh, delivery. Uh, and uh, many of his uh, prior customers are now uh, living farther away from the restaurant or not working in the same area, right? They're not visiting it for lunch on weekdays, but they still fall within the delivery range. So there is a potential for reaching these customers still with these engaging visuals, consistent branding overall. Uh, James, I'll chime in with a question. Um, interesting perspective. And I was a skeptic on the idea that improved digital engagement could support Godwin because he is very digitally engaged, but you sold me. Um, so moving on from that, um, you kind of presented the problem uh, or the opportunity of this 25 mile radius in, in, in the trade area. Um, you half solved the problem of freeing up his time and improving the digital footprint. And you said to free him up to focus on operations, but you didn't really talk about how he actually scaled. Right. From our uh, conversation with Godwin, he uh, does not have immediate plans to scale, uh, although his uh, eventual vision is to uh, move the restaurant beyond its current state and turn it into a full marketplace. Uh, he just uh, compares it almost to a Trader Joe's concept. Um, but at the current moment, uh, we uh, chose to focus away from uh, scaling the business uh, in that sense. Uh, simply because it's not in Godwin's vision at the moment. If uh, anyone else has anything to add, uh, please do. But uh, I believe that's where we stand at the moment. Oh, yeah. I was going to add to that and also say that um, because um, Godwin's business is like 
it'll be two years, I want to say next April, of him being open and be open for operation and also having the pandemic. Scaling really isn't um, one of his main focuses, but adding the vending machines, um, the marketplace, and a overall proving the customer experience while in a pandemic is one of his main priorities. So um, one of our biggest um, goals was to make sure that we add on to the experience that people can get virtually and increasing customer engagement that way. Um, I think that in the future, we can talk about it, but I think that right now his um, goals are set on um, enriching the experience of others in the current state, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, all great questions. Uh, we're going to take a pause, as I indicated. Uh, we're going to combine the assessment and the pause, and so uh, give people a chance to uh, stretch and uh, do whatever else they need to do. We're going to reconvene promptly, very promptly, at 8.10. And so we have uh, Century Partners, then Shot Spotter, and then we finish up with Tadouli. All right, so promptly at 8.10, we will reconvene. And uh, so go ahead and complete your assessment of uh, Young Village, and uh, we'll be ready to start in a few minutes. Hi, my name is Jasmine Johnson, and I'm going to be presenting on the behalf of Century Partners with the rest of my team, Nathan, Chloe, Sarah, and Reese. So as I said before, my name is Jasmine and I'm 21 years old and I was born and raised in Detroit. Detroit has definitely changed drastically over the years. The Detroit I know is definitely different from the Detroit that my family knows. My grandfather, he worked at Chrysler since the age of 18. And during around this time, like the 1950s, Detroit was booming. We had businesses, jobs, and just a lot of economic growth in the city. And the in the early 2000s, when the recession hit Detroit, this reality changed drastically for the people that live in Detroit, especially for me, because I grew up when Detroit was facing a major decline. There were a lot of lack of jobs and the, the housing market took a major hit. So much that my uncle house foreclosed and he had to stay with me and my mom. And that's why my mom continues to rent till this day. And growing and when I get older for my kids I don't want them to experience that and I want to be a homeowner and be able to change that reality for them so now I'm going to pass it off to Reese just to discuss this a little further yeah thank you Jasmine so much like her family has gone through many people have witnessed or even experienced the pains from the decline and eventual bankruptcy of Detroit in 2013 Many Detroiters li were living in poor conditions in areas with high crime rates and suffering from poverty. However, some of these Detroiters and some of those who witnessed this decline have money and want to help revitalize the city. Yet, when these people began to seek mediums to help, they were faced with the lack of opportunity to do so because they did not have the available cash reserves, which the city was seeking from private investors. And this brings us to the issue that uh, Century Partners is addressing, which is how there's a lack of uh, safe and desirable neighborhoods in Detroit for recent college graduates, senior citizens, working class individuals and families, as well as a lack of investment vehicles for investors, especially those native to Detroit, in order to contribute to their own community development. This statistic of how 58% of Detroiters are cost burden is just an example of how prevalent this issue is throughout Detroit. And with that, I would like to pass it off to my colleague, Nathan Ullman, uh, to take it over from here. Yeah, thank you, Reese. So, you know, as Reese and Jasmine showed us, uh, Detroit residents need access to affordable housing. And there are investors in Detroit who have the capital to help solve this problem, but there's a shortage of investment vehicles for them to invest in. So the missing piece is that middleman. It's that urban entrepreneur who can connect the residents with investors and put their money to use. So this is where David Alade and Andrew Cologne come to save the day. They are the founding partners of Century Partners. They're two Columbia University graduates who moved to Detroit in 2015 and they both fell in love with the city. And you know, they saw the same problems we mentioned earlier and they actually have the tools to help. So David worked on Wall Street for eight years and Andrew started, started a successful real estate company in Mississippi before moving to Detroit. And now they're combining this expertise in real estate and in finance, you know, their superpowers to raise real estate investment funds where they're pooling equity and some debt financing 
from investors and they're using that capital to invest in high quality, affordable residential properties. So just to recap, David and Andrew have identified these two problems that they can solve, but they've also identified a nearly $4 billion business opportunity. We talked about how you know, urban entrepreneurship is more than just doing good for your community. It's about making a profit too. And you know, Century Partners can do just that by tapping into this total available market of over $3.75 billion. So that said, you're probably thinking by now that if there's that much money to go around, this market must be mature and maybe even oversaturated. That's not the case though, it's actually still growing. And that's because many investors think Detroit is a riskier market than it actually is. So this keeps potential competitors away from the market, but at the same time, it makes it harder to raise equity for these investment funds. But again, David and Andrew have this extensive Wall Street and real estate background to draw from. So they are positioned to take advantage of this complex opportunity. It's also a potentially rewarding opportunity in ways that other real estate managers are not. And you know, to figure out how to capitalize on this opportunity though, David and Andrew, and we also needed to talk to, directly to their potential customers and hear their side of the story. And that's what Sarah is gonna walk us through next. Thanks, Nathan. Here at Century Partners, we decided to explore the problem further through primary research. We interviewed three customer segments, investors, college graduates, and working class folks. And we started to notice some patterns, patterns while doing so. College graduates felt as though they lack knowledge during their undergraduate education, but they do care about their return on investment when purchasing their first home or their first apartment. This leads them to being highly influenced during their decision process by their family members or their friends. Second, investors were more concerned about a reliable source of income, but also wanted to get across that they feel connected to Detroit and want to help with community development. And lastly, working class professionals focus on the price of their purchase as well as their distance to work or school for their children, depending on where they are at in their life. So with these, we saw that Century Partners could solve the pains that these customers were feeling. And in fact, one of the individuals we interviewed said that they like to go and visit an area and get a feel for the community before they decide to live there. And one of the investors we interviewed said that they can make money and still do good things for their community. Century Partners wants to meet these needs by providing affordable housing in safe and desirable neighborhoods, while also allowing clients home ownership and rehab properties. We offer investors a high return on investment, and we also put an emphasis on social justice through community development. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Chloe to touch upon our financials and future plans here at Century Partners. Thanks, Sarah. So now I'll break down the revenue and the cost for Century Partners. Our team estimated the total revenue to be around $3 million. And we derive this revenue mostly from fees. So these are fees such as acquisition fees, management fees, and developer fees. And then the bulk of the revenue is generated from this rental revenue. And then the cost of goods sold is approximately $2.4 million. And this is made up of purchasing the homes and apartments, renovating these buildings, commission fees, and then distributing the profits to investors. So taking into account the revenue and cost, we calculated the total profit to be around $600,000. And moving on to our business model improvements for Century Partners, we identified three key areas in which Century Partners could improve upon. The first is alternative sources of revenue. So these are things such as bike rentals and maintenance options for not only rental tenants, but also buyers. The second um, suggestion is for Century Partners to collaborate with other managers on joint ventures. So instead of solely raising money to buy these buildings from investors, two companies or more could partner together and go in and buy these buildings with their joint funds. And so this would help Century Partners gain access to some bigger potential investment opportunities. And then finally, Century Partners, when pitching to investors, can focus on Detroit pride and tap into the investors' connection to the city. And so Century Partners is excited about all of these suggestions. And then future expansion for Century Partners. Century Partners has identified all of these cities on this map as 
cities that are on the brink of a housing crisis. And so Century Partners can come into these cities and provide quality, affordable housing with excellent management. So these are cities that Century Partners can move to in the future after revitalizing Detroit. So now I'll pass it on to Jasmine to wrap up our story. Thank you so much, Chloe. And I don't know about you guys, but hearing all of that, I'm definitely glad there's a real estate company like Century Partners to help people like me. A young Detroit native that has experienced Detroit economic decline and is currently here for the restoration of the city. Affordable housing and safe communities, that's the bare minimum. And that's what citizens should have. And a home is an extremely important asset in one's life. And it's not just about a house, but it's about the symbolism of ownership and generating wealth for your family. And, and that's not and that's not very common with a lot of African Americans in Detroit, and they really don't get to experience it. So Century Partners is going to serve as a catalyst for this change. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm super excited. And I want to thank you, thank David Aladale for meeting with us and being so resourceful and helping us with our information. And if you have any questions, you guys could go right ahead. Okay, thank you, Century Partners team. Questions. Can, can you describe some of the properties that they have? I, I'm just wondering what they look like. I don't know if you have some pictures of what the, their current assets yeah, they, are. Yeah, so they, they do have pictures of some on their um, on their website. And, you know, they're mostly residential properties. So they do have some like bigger, or they're all residential properties. They do have some, you know, bigger multifamily units. Um, but it ranges from everything from, you know, single family homes to uh, multifamily uh, properties. Yeah, I'm just curious, like, with, uh, I'm very much aware of some of the soaring prices in Detroit, but are they squeezing out some of the, and with the rising prices in real estate and rental, is it squeezing out some of the people that they've wanted to serve initially? Just curious. Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, one of the things that Century Partners prides itself on is the fact that they're not gentrifying these neighborhoods. Um, if that, you know, if that answers your question, I think the way that they are able to do that is because Detroit, you know, has experienced this massive population decline, you know, over the last half century or so. Um, and that means there are a lot of abandoned properties. There's a lot of space and not as many people. So rather than pushing people out, they can just, you know, tap into that open space and, and invest there. And that allows them to, you know, build up the neighborhood without, you know, forcing people out of their homes. So let me ask this question, and it's not criticism, but you guys did a great job of kind of explaining what they're doing, but what do you see, like what problem were you able to identify and attempt to solve for them? Yeah, so I think that we, um, we try to touch upon this in our uh, roadmap right there, yeah. So. Um, I think that one thing we, we kind of thought of that wasn't just specific to Century Partners even is that, you know, obviously during COVID, um, a lot of people are unable to pay their rent. Um, and, you know, that, that begs the question, you know, what other revenue streams does the company have to support itself? So, you know, there are a lot of fees that Century Partners is receiving. Um, and, you know, they're, they're still getting a lot of the rent payments, but uh, we thought that it would be helpful to add some other, you know, revenue streams and get some more cash flow going. Um, and, you know, we identified some, some small things, but just things that could be implemented pretty quickly. So, you know, there are bike trails in a lot of these Century Partners neighborhoods. So we thought they could offer bike rentals, um, just things like that, almost like a, um, you know, maybe they could get Ride Scoozy to put, put a bike rental station in that neighborhood, uh, something like that. And then, you know, in terms of our customer discovery process, we did realize that, um, we thought it was kind of, I guess, underrated is, is the word to, um, that a lot of these investors that were looking to invest in Detroit, you know, had this connection to the city and they had a real pride for the city. So we thought that, you know, tapping into this rather than just marketing Century Partners funds as, as typical real estate investment funds would really help to, um, you know, garner some more support. 
So by that, do you mean offering their service effectively as a, a navigator of the market? Sorry, can you repeat that for me? I said, when you say partner up, are you essentially saying to offer their services almost as consultants or as a turnkey service for out-of-state investors or, or investors out of the city? Yeah, you know, we were thinking more like just just um, creating these joint ventures with uh, managers that were maybe even could be competitors, but I, that could be like an out of the city investor that, you know, maybe a, maybe a larger player that has a lot of capital and they don't know where to deploy it. And Century Partners, you know, has a much better understanding of the city itself and could, could partner up and, um, and, you know, go in on a deal with them, you know, providing a lot of the knowledge and expertise while the other partner provided a lot more of the capital, but it also could be, you know, if Century Partners is the, the big fish and, they're uh, partnering with a smaller residential investor that, again, you know, might have a better understanding of the, um, the actual city. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yes. Uh, speaking of um, a few things, but Moses brought up a really good point about um, gentrification in uh, Detroit, having lived there. So I was not born and raised there, uh, Jasmine, but I've lived there for the past two years. And so when you look at um, these properties, do they have, um, you know, have they thought about um, diversifying their portfolio a little bit? And have they considered, so, um, you know, one of the challenges we saw in Detroit, so my significant other, my boyfriend and I have been really wanting to stay and live in Detroit, but we're facing a challenge that a number of young couples face when you're, you know, a couple, but you and your dual income with no children, that's a very different set of considerations, right? Living in Detroit versus I've got kids now and now I have to look at schools. So have you guys thought about, um, one, helping um, this group think about properties that are maybe in areas of Detroit, which are closer to um, school districts that are highly rated? that's one way to diversify the portfolio. Great, that's a great question. I'm kind of, can you just reiterate it one more time? So you're trying to add yeah, something. Sorry, yeah. So I guess, um, you know, there's a lot of gentrification in Detroit. I just checked out the website after you guys said that, you know, they had all their properties listed, but you don't see the locations. So you'd literally have to go in there if you're a Detroit, uh, Detroiter or someone thinking of moving to Detroit and you have to literally enter each uh, property listing. And as someone who lives in Detroit now, who's considering buying a house between $350,000 to $500,000, one of the things that I found uh, challenging navigating their website is that location is so key in Detroit. So whether it's being close to good schools, being walking distance within some of the landmarks, like right now I live by Boston Edison. I'd love to still have that walkability to the Fisher Theater, but right now it's very manual. So if you could maybe speak to that. Are there any strategies you've looked at to help um, the group um, better showcase what properties they have to offer and maybe diversify their portfolio by location? Okay, that makes more sense now. That's actually a great, a great question, Grace. So we will take that into consideration. However, something that I feel like that is really strong with Century Partners that I have learned with talking to David a lot of lay a lot is they're really focused on just community building and being more mm -hmm. close with your neighbor, just finding those spots that you can build a community. So in terms of like showing that on their website, that can be really a, po a good possible recommendation for them. But I know just from what they told me before and just doing additional research, that's something that they're really strong on the community aspect of things. And that can be something um, that they can take in consideration. But thank you, okay. I hope that answered. Yes, it does. Some features that you might want to consider in addition to highlighting the community, there are things like walkability factor. How close are you to some of the, you know, the midtown, the new center area, the, um, you know, the university park, the Sherwood Forest District, um, in addition to some of the schools that are located nearby and um, drive time. So I live in Detroit, but I drive all the way out to uh, Ann Arbor <laughs> because I love Detroit so much. So I don't mind living there. So um, 
like Zillow has a way that you can calculate what your drive time would be if just by entering your office location mm -hmm. from a prospective um, property. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I'll definitely look into that and relay that message to them. All right. Great questions. Uh, and uh, really appreciate that. Now we're going to uh, move along. Um, and um, uh, I would just suggest too, while we're, it, while uh, the uh, shot spotter team is getting ready, <clears throat> maybe I'll connect you, Grace, to David Alade, uh, so you can uh, uh, discuss some of these things also directly uh, with him. Uh, well, yeah. I'll make that I'll make that connection offline. That would be great because interest rates are really low. So you know, Sam and I have been trying to buy a house. Well, all right, very good. So. Uh, Century, uh, not Century, Shot Spotter. Yes. Shot Spotter, you have the floor. Hey, David. Yes. You should make the team close the deal for Century Partners. That would be a real world experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you, you made a good point there. I think the team is going to be <laughs> otherwise engaged after tonight. But uh, no, that's a good point. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. Hi, my name is Annie, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Kevin, Alec, Darian, and Will, and we are representatives from ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter protects and serves the community through gunshot detection technology. Next slide. Over 100,000 Americans are injured and fatally shot each year from gun violence. Think about that. Three million American children witness gun violence every year. Gun violence is affecting people of all ages, including children. Undetected and unprotected gunshot incidents will continue to affect lives each year if action is not taken. Gun violence is a problem, but there's an even larger problem in the fact that 80% of gunshot firings go undetected and unreported. This directly affects police departments and university officials because they cannot effectively do their jobs and protect lives. This then means that less than 20% of shootings are reported to 911. As a result, eight out of the 10 times when someone fires a gun in your neighborhood, the police do not show up simply because they do not know about it. Therefore, the problem is that most gunshots go unreported and undetected. Now I'll pass it over to Alec. Thanks, Annie. So um, speaking more on that, we at ShotSpotter believe that we are the solution to this problem of unreported and undetected gun violence. Um, we provide both police and university security alike with the ability to get real-time alerts within 60 seconds of an active gunshot firing to the exact location. Uh, we're able to do this actually with our unbelievable proprietary technologies, um, basically focused around our patented uh, sensors, our artificial intelligence, as well as our extremely high-tech algorithms, and our overall goal here is to deter future gunshot incidents and disrupt these crime cycles. So moving forward, depicted here on the screen are the five key resources that we believe help us the most in dealing with undetected gun violence. Um, we at ShotSpotter have worked with over 20 different integration partners in 50 cities across the United States to integrate our gunshot alert data uh, in city systems, more specifically focusing with like license plate readers, CAD, geospatial software, and drones. Uh, just to give everyone an example, our point and zoom cameras actually shift and zoom into the specific location as a gunshot occurs in real time, which obviously further helps the police get in an accurate location in a timely manner to help save lives. Yeah, so um, how does all this work uh, in terms of being a business? Well, first, um, through market research, um, we recognize or identify um, viable cities and or uh, campuses that uh, where, where gun violence is a prominent problem. And we recognize that they need a solution. Um, for example, through talking to Ann Arbor police, we discovered that shot spotter solutions aren't a necessity in all cities, especially ones with low to none gun violence crimes. However, once a viable potential customer is identified, um, we reach out to them there's city officials and campus reps and uh, set up demos and begin that uh, customer acquisition, acquisition process. Um, once adopted, um, the physical gunshot detection sensors are then installed in their respective locations, as well as the integration of the shot 
of the software that ShotSpotter provides. Um, after implementation, it's usually within the first two years, if not the first, that we're able to turn a profit. Um, but the results and the communal and the communal communal benefits start almost immediately. Next slide. Um, these results include, but are definitely definitely not limited to um, significant decreases in shootings and homicides, more arrests made in cases solved, and most importantly, more lives saved. Um, essentially, shot spotter effectiveness has been proven to decrease gun-related incidences and help police officers do their job. Moving forward, um, as a company, shot spotter holds a very strong market position. Uh, as their technology and services are protected by 33 patents currently. Um, and as ShotSpotter is all, evolves and creates or adopts new policing technologies, um, the room for new competition will only shrink. Um, overall, ShotSpotter faces no major competition, and uh, this will allow them to just focus on <coughs> ShotSpotter is currently in a 103- United States cities, and we're continuing to expand. So the industry is opportunistic growth with uh, $11 billion. Within the gun shot detection portion, that's $104 billion. So our current business opportunity lies around $500 million, and that should continue to expand as we grow. So as well noted before, our technology is heavily patented and coveted, but major cities like Detroit, Los Angeles, and quite a few others uh, don't actually use ShotSpotter, and that's why we project growth in the future. Because there are no competitors out there, ShotSpotter is not necessarily just a want, it's a major need in order to keep the citizens of the U.S. safe. So initially, when a city becomes a customer of ours, there's a $10,000 upfront starting fee for the development and installation of the technology that's actually needed for that city. And then following installation, the cost for customers can range anywhere from 65 to 95,000 per year per square mile. The key figures that drive the revenue for us are our number of customers, or rather the cities that use ShotSpotter, the square mileage that we cover, and then the purchase price for our services. So in terms of revenue, over the last year, we've grown just under 5 million and maintain an operating profit of approximately 4%. And with the addition of customers, we're going to continue to see uh, growth and that that operating profit will increase. So it takes about two years to make up the cost of, of the actual technology, which is why the operating profit is currently near the lower end. So uh, we take purchase price out of the equation there because we find it to be less of what we want to focus on. Through conducting customer discovery um, over the last couple of weeks, we were able to learn that Everyday people would love to have the ability to be extra protected when it comes to gun violence. I know most of us on the call here would love that. To not fear going outside and, and having that potential threat would be an absolute dream for everyone. Um, as one person said, a gun being fired at someone once is one time too many. So we're very lucky to provide a product and a service that is highly desired by individuals. And in order to work conjunctly between law enforcement and communities, we think it would be really wise to create an app, which Kevin will discuss more about. Yeah, so from our customer discovery Darian had uh, touched upon, we also see this generating value of safety and security directly to the average citizen. Um, and we believe that ShotSpotter can do this by creating a simple mobile app that will provide real-time localized alerts and an easy uh, to use interface. Uh, so how this will work is that you would download the app and then pick the radius selection for the gunshot monitoring. You can then just forget about the app. Uh, if there is a potential gunshot, however, that is identified within your radius selection, you'll be pushed a notification uh, for the identification of the gunshot and urging you to reach a safe location, especially if you're currently outside. <clears throat> um, ShotSpotter can then expand upon its value to the average citizen. So because gunshots will then be detected and people feel protected and connected about what's happening in their environments. On the bottom right, there are two applications, the neighborhood uh, crime watch and citizen. Uh, both of them aggregate uh, witness reporting from the mass population. Uh, and there are both pros and cons in partnering with other applications or ShotSpotter simply developing their own application 
Uh, but one of the biggest benefits for ShotSpotter is that they would easily reach a mass market of individuals while cutting significantly on app development costs and maintenance costs. And from that, we envision ShotSpotter to be in every city so police uh, and campus securities can do a better uh, job in protecting the communities from gun violence. Um, ShotSpotter has continuously invested in AI and machine learning integration, which will help maintain uh, its position as the market leader uh, with, as um, Will have mentioned, ma no major incumbents that can rival ShotSpotter's technology. Um, but as ShotSpotter grows its customer base and operations, we believe that automation of their tier one support um, will not only reduce their personnel costs, which is a huge portion of um, their costs, um, but provide consistent and standardized customer service um, for their customers, police departments and campus security. Um, and then we believe that a six month phase out plan would be the most effective in validating and adjusting uh, for any potential deficits that may occur. And then finally, um, ShotSpotter, uh, whether ShotSpotter develops their own app or partner with another app uh, to deliver their service, we are looking at like a three to nine month timeline um, and ultimately, we believe that ShotSpotter is providing the best gun detection technology that's out there um, so that you and, and everyone in the community is protected uh, because of law enforcement teams that can do a better job and what they do. And with that, we want to thank Professor Par uh, Tarver, uh, Sanya, and Reggie for all their hard work uh, for this course. And we would like to extend um, a special thanks uh, to Ralph and Nassim, our uh, urban entrepreneur um, partner who have supported us in our journey. Uh, we work so well as a team and learned so much about ShotSpotter in the process. And we're extremely grateful to Nassim who have taken time out of a busy schedule every week to work with us. So it was a real pleasure and thank you. And I'll open the floor to questions. Hey, I have one. So um, are the, I saw on your uh, third to last slide, the ShotSpotter, yes, this one. So you mentioned campuses. So who is their target customer? Is it um, universities, K through 12 school districts, um, police departments? That's a great question. Thanks, Grace. So the a main cons uh, customer segment is police departments and then university campus security. Um, because within the jurisdiction of like K to 12, um, and the high schools, middle schools, they're all within jurisdiction of the city. But because the campus is so wide, they actually have their own campus security force. And we also, expand the campus security terms because Microsoft has their own campus, Google has their own campus, and they can also benefit from a campus security team and also these sensors as well. Yes, and uh, the reason why I ask is, um, you know, in the news, one of the, you know, real sad parts of, you know, gun violence, there have been, uh, you know, school shootings. Mm -hmm. So have they considered reaching out to most of these schools do have at least some security personnel now with the recent events? Have they considered expanding the K through 12 school districts? So currently not as of yet. I think um, one of the um, cities that they tried to enter was Detroit. And there are di various different reasons for why a city might discontinue their service. As with Detroit, one of them might be costs. Another might be they don't see the benefit of continuously monitoring for gunshots. Um, and they don't, they don't see like a clear benefit after using the service. So currently they're focused mainly on police departments and then university campus security. But pe I think potentially is a great um, area to explore. And then right. following that up, just to like reiterate what Kevin was saying, because school districts normally fall within the like city limits, then we focus specifically on the police departments because those would be the ones that would be focusing on those specific K through 12 schools. Okay. And uh, as a result, thank you. Great answers, great Kevin and great job, uh, Darian. So that leads me into the next question of, um, you pointed out some very precariously low gross profits there. 4% is, is uh, very, very low. As a physical product company with an app, um, that can be uh, kind of dicey. Have you guys considered like some, like Simply Safe has, is a potential strategic partner who I thought of who has key value propositions of safety and peace of mind. Have you considered partnering with them and offering like a co-subscription uh, or like some sort of co-branded service? I just want to clarify, it's um, the 4% is a net 
operating profits. And okay. the app is not currently being implemented. It's our recommendation for how ShotSpotter can generate more value uh, for the consumers um, that they don't currently serve. Um, and that 4% low margin is strictly due to because they enter a lot of new cities and takes two, uh, about two years because they don't actually charge cities for the sensors that they install. The initiation fee is for the technology itself and setting it up, but they recover the cost through the square mileage coverage, which is 65 to $95,000 a year. It takes about one to two years to recover the cost of installing all the sensors that are needed for a city. And after that, they're generating pure profit. So okay. that's why it's low, but it'll, it'll be continuously exponentially to grow after they're in um, every city for more than two years. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin, because is there the possibility that they could, you know, uh, one of the reasons why Simply Safe popped into, into mind is because they have been growing rapidly, double digit growth, and um, their product offering, though, is at a considerably lower price. It's like $250 for four sensors and like a thing, like their monitoring system, which is plug and play. So is there a potential lower price offering that could be offered and co-branded with a group like Simply Safe? So you don't have to answer. I just wanted to throw that out there as food for thought. I think it's a great um, opportunity, but I think it's a very different in what they do. So to iterate what ShotSpire does, it's a gun detection service and mm -hmm. they have they offer um, a technology to pinpoint a precise location for um, where it's uh, audibly heard the gunshots uh, and it's done through sophisticated software. However, Simply Safe is home indoor monitoring and um, it doesn't detect guns. But I think it, it does create some synergy in terms of possibly indoor gun monitoring, but I think it'd be a lot harder to implement uh, because they're mostly focused on outdoor gun detection. Additionally, what uh, diversifies ShotSpotter from anybody else out there is kind of what Will covered about all of their patents. They do have, like, we do have 33 patents. Um, and I know a design patent lasts about 14 years and a utility patent lasts mm -hmm. around 20 years. So the actual technology, the hardware and the software are what's covered and why the actual pricing might be a bit higher than a couple other indirect competitors that don't necessarily do the same thing. All right, guys, we got to keep moving. I appreciate those questions um, and uh, uh, great discussion. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Trey Wilbur and speaking with me tonight will be Brad Robbins, Howie Chang, Bryn Jackson, and Lindsay Goldman. And we are representing Todooly, a service that helps you to seize your day. So real quick, I just want everybody to think back to the last time that they needed to get some yard work done, but just dreaded the thought of it. If you're like most people, you probably don't have to think back very far because in fact, Americans collectively spend tens of millions of hours a year just on tedious yard work. And that's time that I think we could agree could be better spent on more important things. You shouldn't have to spend too much time or too much money just to have a nice looking property. Ideally, a homeowner should be able to have a well-kept property without spending too much of their own time doing the work or spending too much of their money hiring a professional service. One way to do this is to provide the opportunity for young students to do your yard work for you. Enter Todooly. Todooly is, is an online platform that connects homeowners with college-aged students who are willing to do their yard work for them at a fraction of the price of what a professional service might cost. And this has two purposes. Of course, the obvious one is that it provides the homeowner or it saves the homeowner uh, money and time, but it also helps to minimize the opportunity gap that is prevalent in so many of our cities by giving the, the young students an opportunity to make good money and expand on their work experience and expand their uh, professional network. And at that, I would like to pass it off to Howie. But what actually makes Doodly capable of providing that solution? 
while there are several things that makes us stand out. First, it is the to-do list connection to our helpers. Uh, our funders were coming from similar backgrounds as in Chilean immigrants. Uh, we share the same pain that our helpers were experiencing, having no jobs and no experience to actually lend anything. Um, secondly, it is our Uber-like business model that utilizes young people needing to work to complete other people's daily tasks. And lastly, it is to do these unique leveling system and words that words active, and positive engagement in forms of money and personal recommendation letters from the RCOs. Uh, next. So speaking about our team at Todooly, um, Sergio Rodriguez is our urban entrepreneurship partners who is in charge of the business as well as the organization and communication of the company. The other two co-founders are Jose and Armando, each heading the recruitment part and the technical supply lead of the company. We also have two full stack developers and the VP in operation to assist Sergio, making the team of Todooly a well-rounded one that covers various parts of the business. Next. So in terms of the roles that we need to be filled into Dooley, uh, we can further improve the roster with a dedicated position to manage helpers in relations and the reach to our, our um, helpers, elevating the burden from our current marketing um, field to from Jose and allow for a specialized focus to our maintain our helpers relationship. Todoli could also benefit from a designer in charge of the visual design as well as overall branding to improve the current marketing materials as well as our user interface on both the website and the mobile app. Uh, I'll press that too. Um, diving deep into the, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, diving deep into like the business model and how the business actually works. So kind of like how Howie and Trey were saying, it's sort of an Uber-like business model where the workers would be essentially like the drivers of the Uber company as they would fulfill a call to action that the homeowners uh, call out. And they're essentially like the, uh, the people who call for rides like an Uber. Um, and how the business makes money is through, uh, as of right now, it's the, the revenue stream of uh, taking commission based on each job. Um, and according to our um customer discovery, uh, the need for, or the home, the homeowners, uh, there's, there's a large opportunity for, for homeowners. Um, but <clears throat> the, uh, the workers are pretty hit or miss. Um, as far as, as far as improvements, um, to our business model, we suggest there are more revenue streams, uh, maybe by developing a relationship with other key partners, um, such as like maybe, uh, local distilleries who make hand sanitizer since uh, the time of COVID is pretty difficult or uh, local businesses that provide like lawn care um, and uh, paying workers based on commission. Um, there's also the idea that how we were saying uh, more of a social media presence um, as far as marketing and branding and thinking outside the box. Um, we discussed possibly like Zoom advertisements while waiting in meetings. Um, you would see advertisements rather than just seeing a blank screen. And there's also the idea of job length. Uh, job length on average is around six hours. And if you're targeting a university student population, uh, a lot of university students just simply don't have the time. That's why it was pretty hit or miss uh, during customer discovery. Uh, there are some students who are willing to and some students who, who just simply didn't have time for it. Um, next slide. Um, and it's amazing with just such like a, a niche market of outdoor low skill, uh, like lawn care labor, um, how, how large the opportunity is. If you just capture even 1% of the market, you have an opportunity to be a multi-million dollar company. Um, it is, you know, especially during a, sorry, one second, um, especially during like a, a growth phase in, in, in this niche market is, uh, it is like such as a, a Detroit suburb, um, you know, there's, there's multiple universities uh, to, you know, develop relationships with to gain uh, low skill workers. Um, and the, obviously the homeowner market around uh, universities uh, require, you know, yard work and have a bunch of home, homeowners. Uh, next slide. And then uh, discussing uh, competitive positioning um, in order to uh, get, maintain, and grow our market share, um, 
we would like to develop and maintain both customer segments. So we would like to just not be able to, you know, kind of go hit or miss like a, a one-time thing for uh, both a homeowner and a worker. We would like to keep the relationship ongoing and not only keep the relationship ongoing, but develop new relationships um, with more workers and more homeowners. Um, and there's also the idea of uh, fundraising. And then as far as competitive advantage, we narrowed it down to both service and price. Um, with high quality service and a price that is lower than professional care, um, it is pretty hard to beat to Dooley. And there's also the idea of network building, uh, potential connections to future endeavors. Um, I know we discussed uh, ideas such as letters of recommendation to future endeavors and uh, et cetera. So next slide. So we projected a gross merchandise value of $50,000 uh, $50, for this year, which results in a net revenue of $10,000. However, these numbers are a lot lower than they likely should have been due to the coronavirus pandemic impact hindering in-person work. And then our primary and only revenue stream comes from connecting the helpers to the homeowners and making a fee off of that transaction. And then looking at our cost of service, it is uh, roughly 5%, which will drop as Dooley continues to scale. Okay, guys, is that it? No. All right. Muted. I totally did not realize I was muted. So, um, the customer discovery findings led to a change in the business model canvas by we changed the employees who we originally saw as a dual customer segment uh, to a key partner instead. And our interviews provided further evidence that homeowners are in need of affordable and easily accessible housework assistance and college students struggle to find part-time employment. Next slide. So then looking at next steps for Todooly, we plan to first focus on implementing a reward prep program for the helpers, which will help them with professional development as Brad mentioned earlier. So with this program, when they reach a certain amount of hours worked through the app, they would receive a letter of recommendation from Sergio that they could use to help them find employment. And then we also believe that revising and expanding our marketing efforts will increase awareness and user acquisition. And we think this should be done by advertising on meeting platforms like Zoom and connecting with school authority figures to replace current um, in-school recruiting events. And then in the coming years, we also think it's important that Todooly like, expand its contractor channels. So in summation, Todooly is a great service that helps homeowners who need work done to students willing to find jobs. And as we've expressed, Todooly is already flourishing. And even still, we have found even more ways for Todooly to continue its growth. We expect that this will not be the last time you hear the name Todooly, as their young and experienced team puts them at in a, is in a, in a unique position. Sorry stumbling over my words, uh, to capture a sizable share of the market. We'd also like to thank Sergio for really going above and beyond with his help and mentorship throughout this project. We learned far more than just Todooly's business model, and we're very grateful for all of his advice and insight. Okay, thank you, Todooly team. Questions? I'll dive in. Um, so I, I know I'm old. And so I'm in a space where the whole, the gig economy is just different from what I grew up with. Um, but I do know that now there's kind of a, um, there's been a bit of a reckoning on some of the ethics of it. Um, and, and, and then also from a quality control perspective of how you manage your community of contractors uh, both the quality of the work and then also like folks who may depend on you, like if you're pegging your ideal labor force as college students looking for extra work, there's other folks that fall outside of that that may very well gravitate towards this. So, A, how do you see yourself learning from some of the past, you know, either mistakes or lessons of different companies who have kind of built their labor force and business model on gig economies? And, and how do you 
see your ability to have a healthier relationship uh, with your contractor base in a way that makes customers feel comfortable with it. Yeah, so I think um, Sergio and us, we talked a lot about how um, he learned a lot from looking at how TaskRabbit, another popular, you know, odds and ends uh, gig economy type of uh, platform, he, he learned a lot from that app and how that was going along um, and wanted to specialize just in one area um, to provide a more quality service. And again, going back to like uh, the very intimate relation that relationship that uh, Sergio and the founders have with the contractors uh, in providing them kind of like, you know, a, prof a professional network, you know, working if they, you know, keep working um, or the longer they work rather. And that can kind of ensure that the customers will get quality work. I think there's also talk of implementing a kind of uh, worker review kind of functionality so that uh, the customers can be sure that when uh, their contractor shows up, even though they're a college student, that they will provide them with quality work. Additional questions? Yeah, just is real quick. Um, I find it kind of strange in, in terms of college students sort of displacing probably low educa um, undereducated individuals and people who uh, may rely on sort of manual labor for a living. Um, when I looked at the video on the website, again, it's these two white boys college students show up at the door to help out at home. I'm just wondering if the company has thought or you thought of the unintended consequences of sort of displacing sort of people who rely on these jobs for their income and giving it to college students who have higher opportunity in the future. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I'll bite on that one. Um, so there's one very stark distinction between, you know, the the typically more undereducated, um, maybe landscape worker or lawn care worker who works for the job professionally and a to-do worker. And that is the complexity of the job. So typically you'll have the to-do worker doing stuff like mowing the lawn, weeding, maybe planting something, mulching, you know, tasks that are just annoying enough to want to hire somebody, but might be too expensive to have a professional uh, lawn care service come in and do. Uh, the workers, the, the to-do workers won't be doing stuff like, I don't know, uh, full-on landscaping or paving uh, paving pads or whatever, you know, what, whatever you have you. Um, so yeah, it really comes down to the complexity of the job and the cost of uh, hiring a professional service to mow your lawn. And to add on to that, uh, one of Sergio's biggest visions with creating this business was actually to provide um, underprivileged kids an opportunity for professional development and to grow their network uh, because it was, he thought of this whole business from when he was a kid and he did a bunch of odd jobs to make money and compared to other more privileged kids, he didn't have the same opportunities. And so this was sort of a way of, um, I, I guess the video might not do it justice, but sort of the way for kids to be able to expand their network. And that's the idea with the letter, the recommendation letters too, is to help give kids a, just a step up almost. Um, and we also, they also don't just work with college students. Uh, they work with high school students and, um, yeah, so they're, I, sorry if we didn't make that clear, but young, it's pretty much just young people in general. Okay. So, uh, we have e e exhausted our time and, uh, we're actually right on schedule. Um, so, uh, can you guys see my screen now? It says wrap up. 
Yep. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. Uh, and so I want to give you, um, everyone, a few minutes to um, just uh, reflect on your responses and complete your responses. And again, remember, even after you uh, submit your response, again, you'll get an email and you'll have an opportunity to uh, go back through and modify it if you want. Uh, or you can just be done after you uh, submit uh, your uh, responses now. So let's take a minute and just reflect on the uh, assessment. Thanks for all the teams, uh, the hard work uh, this uh, semester. And, and as I said before, thank you especially to the Urban Entrepreneur uh, Partners. It's quite a time commitment uh, and an attention commitment on their part. And uh, thanks to uh, our reviewers tonight who uh, asked some good questions. And I think, uh, you know, you guys bring a real world perspective to this thing and an experience that uh, I think is valuable. Uh, and uh, hopefully the students will uh, reflect on your questions and uh, take that with them the next time they have an opportunity to evaluate uh, a business like, like these. So take a minute. Do your assessment. This has been quite a quite a semester. Very different. I'm gonna try not to get emotional. <laughs> okay, so um, you can still be wrapping up your assessments. I just wanna uh, reiterate with the students, uh, we just have a few uh, odds and ends left this week. Uh, the uh, uh, final business model report, you know, the backup for your presentation, um, the uh, final reflection essay, uh, your CATME peer review, uh, that's an extra credit item, uh, and uh, the uh, final teaching evaluation. All of that stuff uh, is due uh, by the end of the day on Friday. So uh, hope you all can get all of that in. Uh, we definitely need to get all of that in. Uh, and I uh, just wanna say uh, it's been a pleasure having all of you uh, this semester, this uh, very unusual time. As I said, I wish that we could have been together, uh, you know, in the classroom, but we made the best of it and uh, you guys really hung in there and uh, and uh, did a good job this semester. So happy holidays and good luck with uh, where you go from now. And you know, I have to close out uh, with the CFE slide and uh, just say uh, risk, fail, try, do, and don't forget to say go blue. <laughs> Okay, so you guys can take a few minutes and finish up and uh, just uh, submit everything. And uh, as you finish up, feel free to sign off and, and take off. Thank take you. care. All right. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Happy New Year. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, David. Take Thank care. You. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Grace. All right. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everybody. Great work, everyone. Have a oh, good thank you. Have a good one. All righty.